Today's webinar is entitled Ensuring Australian Climate Model Simulations Inform Global Clim Climate Assessments and will be provided by Dr. Simon Marsland from CSIRO. Simon is team leader of coupled climate modelling in the access group of the CSIRO Climate Science Centre. He is a deputy chief investigator of the hub's current project 5.1 on access evaluation and application and was lead chief investigator of the previous hub project 2.0 uh, one preparing access for CMIC 6. Simon has 25 years of experience researching the ocean's role in global climate. He's a member of a large number of modelling groups and committees, including the World Climate Research Program Working Group, group on Coupled Modelling, and he is co chair of the WCRP Clivla Ocean Model Development Panel and is involved in a number of different research organisations as well as the hub, including the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania and the ARC Centre of Excellence for Climate Extremes. Simon is also a review editor of the upcoming IPCC Assessment Report 6 uh, for Chapter 9, Oceans, Cryosphere and Sea Level. So I imagine that will keep him nice and busy. So I think we'll just dive straight in, into it. So over to you, Simon. Thanks very much, Sonia, and thanks very much everyone for coming along today and hearing about ensuring how the ACCESS, Australia's climate model, will inform future global climate assessments. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners, First Nations people of the lands here in Aspendale, where I am, but also of all the lands where um, everyone is who's joining us today from across the country, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, emerging and future and um, wish a happy birthday to the National Indigenous Dialogue on Climate Change, which was um, a really nice opportunity one year ago today to be participating on the Yorta Yorta Nation lands um, along the Murray River where NESP hub climate scientists met with a um, broad range of Indigenous folk from across the nation for a few days to have a, have a uh, initial dialogue on climate change. And that was a really humbling and uh, special experience. And uh, looking into the future, probably over the next few months, the re uh, report from that will come out through the NEST Pub. So that's something to look out for in the future. I don't want to fill you up with acronyms, but just to uh, get through the next 40 minutes or so, um, Sonia's already mentioned World Climate Research Program and the Couple Model Intercomparison Project. So WCRP CMIP. Our national um, weather and climate model across all time scales is ACCESS, the Australian Community Climate and Earth System Simulator. And one of the main next users of the data we're going to produce with ACCESS or are now producing for CMIP is the intergovernmental, uh, intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which has a forthcoming assessment report coming out in 2021, the AR6. I ran a pub test, being a uh, scientist, I had to do 30 pubs to get the statistics right. Everyone had heard about this seven or eight weeks ago, ago that you'd stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. That was in New York. Um, what the people at the pub hadn't heard was that the science advisory group to the UN Climate Action Summit, the meeting where Greta Thunberg was meeting at the time, put out a nice little document, United in Science. And it uh, laid out some of the key messages. So just uh, working around the, the uh, policy relevance of climate science and the importance of climate science where we are today, where in our warmest five year period over 2015 to 19, global average, we're around 1.1 degree above pre-industrial uh, levels in terms of global average temperature. The impacts have been seen to be hitting harder from, from uh, climate change than they were predicted even a decade ago. Emissions continue to grow at 2% annual. Uh, last year, 2018, a record 37 billion tonne emissions. Emissions won't peak, it's estimated in 2020, let alone 2030, and we're really gonna have to make um, much larger reductions in emissions to meet the Paris goals across all sectors. And that's not just affecting people's lives, that's affecting global economies. And the World Economic Forum puts out its global risks each year. The panel on the left here shows a full set across 
across our many sectors and areas. The, um, across the bottom is a uh, increasing likelihood. Going upwards is increasing impact. And I won't go into the full details, but if I just blow up this top corner of the chart here of, of um, perceived future risks, most of them are these green environmental risks around extreme weather, failure um, on mitigation and adapt adaptation, biodiversity loss, man-made environmental disasters. So these are the ones that are seen to be higher in likelihood and also very high in impact. That's just some scene setting. Another birthday, uh, World Climate Research Program, 40th anniversary this year. There'll be a number of functions for those fortunate enough to attend the American Geophysical Union meeting in Washington next month. That's the structure of the World Climate Research Program. And I sit in, in here in the coupled modeling, working group on coupled modeling. Um, beyond that, the WCRP aims to uh, address a number of grand challenges around climate science, things that we still need to improve does this through four core projects, um, CLIC, which is around the cryosphere, the ice in, in the global system, CLIVAR, where I, where I also sit in Ocean Model Development Panel, which is an uh, ocean atmosphere realm of climate, GWEX, which is um, the land atmosphere, global energy, water and energy exchange, and SPARC, which is a stratosphere, troposphere, so upper atmosphere, chemical processes, etc. It's also one core project at WCRP called Cordex, and that's the Coordinated Regional Downscaling Experiment. And I'll come to that towards the end, as it's a, also a very important next user of the CMIP uh, model outputs. I thought it was quite prescient of Pink Floyd to produce a sticker in their late 70s album, Wish You Were Here, attached to Welcome to the Machine. Um, which looks very similar to the modern Clivar core projects logo to me, but it has this nice it's kind of computational aspect to it. And that's where uh, the modeling we do with Access really fits in, taking the science, putting it onto computers, running models and uh, um, improving models and making predictions for the future. The coupled model intercomparison project is um, been overseen by the working group on coupled models and has been since 1995. It's trying to coordinate modelling centres around the world into doing common experiments using common data formats. That's really important. The early experiences in the late 90s and across um, the early 2000s was the great difficulty uh, new scientists and uh, early career scientists had picking up a number of models which had completely different data formats, et cetera. And it was a huge learning uh, curve and jump for each individual scientist who came on board trying to analyze multi-model outputs from the CMIP project. And all the way along, we've had this increasing modeling complexity, which I show here, you know, starting off in the seventies, we had global atmosphere um, general circulation models. And by the mid eighties, land surfaces were incorporated into those. In the 90s, when I was starting out in science, it was ocean and sea ice was being incorporated and coupled into these models. Sulfate aerosols, um, carbon cycles and, and so on. We're getting up into atmospheric chemistry, dynamic vegetation in the land system now. Increasingly complex models, not because they're bells and whistles and more fun and include more people, but because as the science develops over the last 30 or 40 years of the WCRP, we really understand that you know, a lot of these extra components play important roles in the climate system. In going about setting up CMIP-6, the latest phase, we focused on three basic science questions. One very important one, how does the Earth system respond to forcing? And when I say forcing, I'm talking not just natural forcings like volcanic eruptions, etc., or changes um, in the intensity of the sun cycles, but also the forcings that are anthropogenic as well. So from the emissions such as carbon dioxide that the human societies produce. A very important one is on the origins and consequences of systematic model biases. Models are models, they're not perfect, but um, they continue to improve. And uh, we, tr we uh, try for a project like CMIT, a coordinated project, to learn from the common experience of uh, all the different models and modeling centers that participate. 
And finally, how can we assess the future climate change given the underlying climate variability um, and predictability? And that climate variability could be things like the El Nino Southern Oscill Oscillation going from La Nina years to El Nino years, which have you know, broad consequences across the earth and it can tilt the global average plus or minus one degree either way, just in the natural variability. And then we superimpose on that the climate change. So um, understanding and assessing that and recalling that the future is not certain because what happens in the future depends on society's decisions around emissions, etc. as we go forward. The second level of guidance was uh, around the WCRP grand challenges and these were a, a community driven bottom up um, attempt to, to really address what were the main deficiencies or areas where the greatest improvement could be found uh, in the science and they're around clouds, melting ice, um, which also has consequences for sea level, uh, weather and climate extremes, uh, water and, and how that uh, affects the world food basket, regional sea level change and the coastal impacts, especially important for a country like Australia where 85% of the population are living near the coast the carbon feedbacks in the climate system and near-term climate predictions. So that's around addressing what's happening in the multi-year, multi-annual to kind of decadal timescale, which is kind of a grey zone in our prediction. We're very good now at numerical weather prediction where we're forecasting the weather and even the seasonal out to a few months. Uh, we're pretty good at forecasting future climate, we believe, and in between there's still quite some work to be done on, on the near-term. So those three questions and seven challenges were put out to the community in terms of modelling to comparison projects, which would be included in CMIP. And basically, we were looking for um, modelling to comparison efforts that one addressed at least one of the one of the key questions and at least one of the um, WCRP grand challenges, but also had a uh, community support. So a number of groups had to commit to actually performing, um, participating in the MIP, eight groups, and to get them approved to be actual modelling to comparison projects for CMIP 6, at least three groups had to do a demonstration uh, project and publication showing um, the viability of the experiments that they were proposing. And out of that effort, um, there, there's a special issue of geoscientific model development there that um, documents all 21 of the model into comparison projects that, that got up and also the forcings that he that are used especially in the scenario experiments and the historical experiment the various forcings so there's a wealth of information in the literature sitting behind this work that's the iconic kind of schematic of what CMIP 6 now looks like and the deck at the center of that is the diagnosis, evaluation, and characterization of Klima, which is uh, German for climate. And this basically defines an entry card for a modeling group such as Access to enter into CMIP 6. The deck itself um, is four key experiments. There's an atmospheric model into comparison project over 1979 to 2014. So from that, you prescribe sea surface temperatures and get some idea of how the atmospheric model is responding in, and directly comparable to the real world over the, the satellite era where we have you know, relatively good observations in the modern era. There's a pre-industrial control simulation of 500 years, which is a baseline run at 1850 um, kind of environmental conditions of 1% per year carbon dioxide uh, increasing experiment and a, a abrupt four times CO2 experiment. Those last two experiments are kind of highly I I idealized and uh, quite quite strong changes, but they're designed to, to investigate the sensitivity of models to change. The other aspect, if you want to enter a model into CMIP 6, is um, to do a historical simulation over the period 1850 to 2014 with defined forcings and um, run that model out. Do those five simulations, do the data processing, follow the conventions and that's an entry into CMIP 6. <coughs> Around that lies 
the 21 model into comparison projects, the MIPS that I've, I've already mentioned. Um, and that process is well underway and going and, and many, many groups are submitting to it around the world. The CMIP6 controlled vocabularies are an attempt to um, publish the output from these models in a very defined way that allows us to, to uh, analyze them in very systematic um, and easy manners. And if you start interrogating the controlled vocabularies around CMIP6, there's uh, various, various variables defined there, such as the activity ID, you find, yes, there's 21 model into comparison projects. You look at the Institute ID and you find there's 48 centres or consortia involved, including um, CSIRO Arxis, the Australian Research Council, Council Centre of Excellence for Climate System Science, which is the new access coupled model version two, and CSIRO as an individual cons um, institute for our access uh, system model. Look at the source ID and you see that those 48 centres have um, submitted 124 individual models so far into the process. You look at the experiment ID and you see in addition to these four, um, five entry level simulations I spoke about, that the MIPS themselves uh, added to that give a total of 299 defined experiments. It's the most uh, comprehensive um, coordinated climate modeling experiment ever conceived. Of those 299 experiments, 104 or so are tier one, so important ones. So you don't have to do them all, you have to do the, um, the entry level to get a model in there, then you have a choice for each centre of, of which of the MIPS you're going to contribute to. It's expected by going out to those institutes and, and um, surveying them, about what their intentions are, that CMIP6 is going to produce around 20 to 40 petabytes of data, which is absolutely huge. It's orders of magnitude above the previous CMIP5, which was magnitudes above the previous CMIP3. So we're really starting to enter into the uh, high performance data, big data space. It's not quite on the scale of large satellite projects, which are more around 150 petabytes or the Large Hadron Collider, same around 150 petabyte, but climate science is really emerging into, a, in, into this big data area, which provides further challenges for us. The top panel there is how this time, um, timeline for CMIP6 was anticipated back in May 2016 when it was starting out. The bottom panel is reality. Um, it was anticipated that the scenario for the um, future forcings would be available by start of 2017. In fact, they weren't available till well into 2019, for example. Even for the historical simulations, it was um, around April 2016, they were first anticipated to be available. The reality was it was mid 2018. So there have been some teething problems along the way in getting these experiments underway, but um, at this stage in 2019, everything has settled down and modeling groups are working very hard around the world to, to meet uh, deadlines going forward. That's just a random picture, just to snap you back into attention because I'm gonna change tack slightly having introduced CMIP6 at this stage. And turn to the access model which I mentioned at the beginning. So it's a national effort since 2005. It's all timescales, weather to climate, seasonal, uh, decadal work starting out. Has local and imported components. The parent model of the atmosphere is um, from the UK, UK Met Office, the unified model. And we sit in a uh, unified model partnership led by the Met Office, but also including the Indians, Koreans, Australians from Bureau of Meteorology, CSIRO, New Zealanders as well. Uh, so a number of nations um, <coughs> participating in the development and use of a particular model out of the UK Met Office. For the ocean, we are using what's called MOM, the Modular Ocean Model out of the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, which is part of um, US National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration and a sea ice model called SICE coming out of the Los Alamos National Laboratory, also in the US. Um, 
There is uh, atmospheric chemistry also coming out of the United Kingdom and, <coughs> excuse me, some particularly Australian components, the land surface, the cable model, um, the ocean carbon cycle, one that coming out of the Hobart group at the CSIRO. It's been strongly supported also by the uh, NESPER system and climate change hub, the development. There's also an uh, increased national collaborative research infrastructure strategy um, scoping stage underway around where access might move into the future. And I should really mention the national computational infrastructure. So that's our supercomputing centre up in Canberra, um, instrumental to this kind of work. One, in having a place to run the models. Two, in having a place to um, do the data processing, etc. And thirdly, they're playing a, a very important part internationally in getting um, CNIP6 model data out discoverable in, in a coordinated way, which I'll come to and touch on later. So as I said, from weather and that's um, access, we, we all use it when we look at the weather forecast every day for a numerical weather prediction. That's this morning's prediction for later on this afternoon. It's gonna be hot in the north and the west and uh, there'll be implications for that and right out to climate. So that's the CNIP5 for a low emission scenario, looking at what the world might look like in, at the end of this century compared to a high emission scenario. And I'm showing uh, global surface temperatures there. So we have choices to make around our emissions as societies and we have um, some understanding of worlds that we're heading towards depending on those choices. We've got two access configurations for CNIP6, the Earth system model. Uh, it's based on our CNIP5 model, Access 1.3, but very importantly, includes this extra complexity around the carbon cycle in, in, um, and the carbon exchanges between ocean, land and atmosphere. Uh, it's, it's also quite a bit less expensive to run, which means they can do many more experiments, longer spin-ups, and you do need a much longer uh, millennial scale spin up for carbon cycle pools to equilibrate in the ocean and, and on land as well. And CM2, our new model, it's got a more sophisticated chemistry in the atmosphere, aerosol scheme, uh, cloud interactions, etc. higher vertical resolution and a higher top. So our previous model goes to 35 kilometres or so uh, vertical in the atmosphere. The new model goes up to 85 kilometres. It's a physical model only at no carbon cycle um, based on, on the UK Met Office version, but where they use the Jules land scheme, we are swapping in the cable um, Australian land scheme. And I don't want to make that sound trivial. That's, I just talked about a few people's work for a couple of years in one dot point. Um, some further details to resolution of the model. It's about uh, 1.8 by 1.25 degree in the atmosphere around one degree and 50 levels in the ocean. And um, we get time steps going forward of around 20 minutes and couple on an hourly basis between the various components. <coughs> it's getting down to some details, but basically um, focus here, we can run the CM2 model at around four years um, in a real time day. Um, sorry, four and a half, four to five years in a real time day, and it takes about four hours on the supercomputer at NCI to simulate a, a, a single year. <coughs> and it's really the atmosphere where a lot of that cost is going. It's not just the, um, yeah, I'll just come back to that point. The, the deck itself and the entry level experiments is around 1200 years or so of simulation time, but um, or 1300, but um, there's several thousand years in development and spin up that goes on behind that. And that's a picture of our uh, 950 year spin up out to here of the CM2 version of the model that we're submitting to CM6. We didn't really know actually till we're out to about 1100 years that this was a model we were happy with. Changes in colors along the way represent work over. Um, the second half of 2018, first half of 2019, finding problems along the way, uh, finding fixes along the way, making small changes. And that's kind of the pathway where we got to something we thought was a spun up model where we could commence the actual CNIP6 simulations. 
here's a bunch of models that are available currently on the NCI system, the data from them. So that's uh, 30 models, there's quite a spread. We're in Kelvin here. Um, and we're looking at the historical simulation. So we're looking at 1850 to 2014, that 165 year simulation. And um, just gray out all those different models from around the world and color in the access CM2 for you. And we're sitting about in the middle of the, of the spaghetti there. So uh, it turns out we're reasonably happy with, with where we lie within the spread of models in terms of our historical simulation and in terms of where we wound up after the spin-up simulation that I showed you in the last slide. There's a comparison of the CM2 in orange, the historical simulation, once again, the gray is a bunch of other models that are, the data is available to us. Uh, the multi-model mean across all those models we have available is in the green running through here, and then um, the, the new model CM2 in the orange, and the black shows observations over the last 100, 165 years. So um, that's how we're performing. I think the uh, the kind of the slope in the warming here coming that's kicking in from 1970 onwards is uh, looking pretty reasonable compared to observation. Then you throw humans into the system. We have choices and importantly, because of a project like CNIP-6, we have informed outcomes. We have some idea of what our choices in terms of emissions will mean in terms of the future climate. So that's, I think, uh, one of the really most important of, of all the model intercomparison projects is the scenario, Nick, talking about the future scenarios. And um, the socioeconomic kind of community come up with, with this picture here, um, which looks at increasing mitigation challenges as climate change progresses versus increasing adaptation challenges for a number of future worlds. And this is a very nice, benign, sustainable world down here um, with low adaptation and low mitigation challenges. This is a more fragmented um, world, maybe with more warfare, et cetera, division which has really high adaptation and mitigation challenges. And uh, this one here is conventional development. It's about the pathway we're on at the moment. It's also the, the one that produces the largest future climate change. So from this kind of socioeconomic analysis, we go to this kind of um, matrix defining the setup of the scenario MIP. And here in green, you have what would be familiar to people uh, who know about CMIP5, the representation concentration pathway. So these were equivalent kind of what per meter squared changes by end of century. Um, and a, a, a lot of uh, CMIP5 work concentrated on a low emission of 4.5 or 2.6 and a high emission of, of 8.5. The dark blue ones here of a tier one, um, experiments for CMIP6 and we've performed all of those for access CM2 out to 2100 and ensembles of all of those for the uh, slightly cheaper to run Earth system model ESM 1.5 at this stage and in the process of, of processing that data. That's, that's the experimental design, that's the corresponding emissions that, that go with that. So. Um, this was the historical, which was prescribed the experiments based on what has been emitted in the past. And then these are the four tier one uh, scenarios going, going forward. Um, this one, uh, the 2.6, uh, re requires a real reversal in our emissions going forward. Um, quite dr dramatically, we tend in the past to be uh, tracking along this world and, st and still seem to be um, in the higher emission scenarios. And these are the CO2 atmospheric concentrations that, that those emission scenarios are expected to, to lead towards in the future. Future projections from some of our simulations and we have the CM2 in solid and the ESM 1.5 in the dash lines here. Uh, running up through the historical from 1960 up to 2015 when the scenario simulations commence and then uh, running forward and here I show you global 
average temperature change in degrees Celsius or, or Kelvin. So you can see that um, the CM2 model in all cases is um, quite a bit more sensitive to changes in CO2 emissions and, and exhibits, a, exhibits a stronger warming than our Earth system model version. Just pause there, give you a breather and uh, see if we can run a little movie of, of uh, how things went. And I thank Roger Bodman from University of Melbourne who, who uh, sits at the um, Aspendale Lab with us here through the NESP ESCC hub for, for producing these with our, this is our latest CM2 um, process quality control data just about to be published and um, we're looking at an, um, annual um, changes in the uh, average air temperature relative to 1850 to 1890. It's already jumped through to 1969 there, but I'll, I'll just let that run forward for a moment. Um, coming up through present day and climate change kicking in, so by around there in 2040 or so, you see, um, the low emission scenario, which was the 2.6 in, in this video, and the high emission, which is the 8.5, are just starting to, um, what this one has, the high emission, um, exceeded the uh, thresholds for the Paris Agreement. So it's not something that we might expect to happen in the far-flung future. It's, it's something that's happening in 20 years or so from now. And you know, if you think back 20 years, I was a postdoc in Germany, it doesn't seem so long ago, project forward 20 years, I'll probably be a retired old man, but it's still not that far in the future. And you know, that, that's um, where we're hitting exceedance of the Paris two degree. It was actually, um, if I could step back, but I don't quite have the functionality on this animation as it is on my laptop, but um, you know, we exceed the 1.5 by around 2030 or so in both cases also. So just continuing on out into the future and uh, the high emissions in particular is, is quite, a, quite a scary world. Just stop it there, otherwise it will disappear just to, uh, get some sense of what's happening, the changes over land um, in CM2 and high emissions above um, six degrees for, for most of the globe. The low emission scenario, which is um, you know, gonna be very challenging to, to achieve, is gonna require considerable international um, cooperation, still looking like uh, quite a changed world there, but certainly not as dramatic as, as what's happening over here. So let those play out and similar for Australia, um, I guess just zooming in the uh, department through NESPOL gives us a very strong focus on what's happening in Australia. It's uh, maybe if your eyes were drawn to very dramatic changes in the Northern Hemisphere or Arctic, then you can see you know, here locally, we're also uh, going, going to uh, be having considerable challenges according to this model. I'll just make that go away and mm -hmm. jump back over here. As I mentioned, there's also a lot of idealized experiments involved in CNIP 6. On the left, we have the 1% uh, CO2 compounding experiment, a bunch of models available to us once again at the NCI at this stage, the multi-model mean in black running through the middle here, uh, access um, seeming actually to remarkably well track the multi-model mean now for the first 100 years or so of that experiment, and then rising a bit above the multi-model mean. This experiment over here is an abrupt four times CO2, so I guess the year zero years, four times CO2, it's like banging the model with a big sledgehammer and in terms of uh, CO2, emissions and uh, getting a real sense of, of the reaction to that. Um, once again, we see CM2 is a little bit more sensitive than, than the multi-model mean. And in general, this spread of models is actually going up into a much higher range uh, than we typically saw in CMIT5 models, which I'll come to hopefully if I keep moving. Why we do, or one of the things we get out of this four times CO2 simulation is an estimate of the equilibrium climate sensitivity of the model. In principle, equilibrium climate sensitivity is that 
you double CO2, you go out to a two times CO2 model, and then you run it for potentially thousands of years. And the models are incredibly expensive computationally to run, so it's impractical to be running them for thousands of years to equilibrium to see what did that two times CO2 mean in terms of uh, global mean temperature change. So this, this is a, a kind of a faster way through this experiment, which is only 150 years or so, to get a, an estimate. And it's an agreed, um, way of doing it so different centres can compare the sensitivities of their models. And what we found in, um, in the new access version was you know, quite a bit more sensitive, 4.7 degrees Celsius from 2.co2 compared to where we were down in, in 3 point something in, in CMIT5 and that's uh, similar in the ESM 1.5 model. In fact, our parent atmospheric model where this sensitivity comes from um, is, is the UK Met Office model, and they're quite a bit higher than us at, at 5.2. Just show a couple of um, results out of the Earth system model. So that's on the left, the historical simulation from 1850 to 2015. And what you're seeing there in the blue is a number of ensemble members, individual simulations showing the ocean uptake of carbon over the historical period. And then in the red, the land uptake of carbon. They're quite similar. And in fact, about um, a third each of the total carbon emission and the other third ending up in the atmosphere. And then uh, on the right hand side, um, you're seeing changes in the carbon flux at the end of that experiment, 2006 to 15, compared to the decade at the beginning of that uh, experiment commencing in 1850. There's a couple of things you can, you can notice there. Uptake, which is the negative on this scale, um, in land in the Northern Hemisphere um, is, is quite high. And that's um, because we have cold temperatures there and CO2 fertilization effects. So a small warming is actually leading to fertilization of boreal forests, etc., in colder um, climates and leading to large carbon uptake. In the tropics, you have more of a temperature effect taking control and um, in, in fact, more carbon outgassing. Um, in Australia, we've, we've still got work to do, and it's part of the, uh, the hub's work going forward into next year is assessing exactly you know, uh, what those signals mean in Australia and, and what we attribute them to. Another really nice thing that you can do once you have the carbon cycle in the system is uh, experiments uh, d designed around CO2 emissions of carbon and um, how climate responds in, in highly idealized experiments. In this experiment, uh, in black, we show the atmospheric CO2 prescribed in the model, that's in the pre-industrial stage, run it at 1% carbon dioxide compounding per year over 140 years out to four times CO2, so quite a very uh, strong value. And then turn that process around and run it back, reducing 1% per year CO2, back to where you were and then leave it running in that pre-industrial state. And in the red, you see the global average temperature response on this scale here. <coughs> and you see immediately that it's not a symmetrical thing that, um, that there's, there's this latency in the response to the temperature. It doesn't just return to how it used to be. And the reasons for that are around um, rates of, down here I show, um, ocean uptake of carbon. So as soon as you, you start to uh, increase it in the atmosphere, the ocean wants to draw down uh, carbon into the deep ocean. At the point where you change the sense of the experiment, change the sign on the carbon, the ocean immediately starts out gassing carbon to the atmosphere again. The land's a little bit more complicated in, um, in, in how it responds. And it's basically those um, fertilization versus temperature effects playing out that I mentioned on the last slide. And congratulations to Tilozine who had a paper around those reversibility experiments with the Earth System model published yesterday. So in summary, you know, some of our highest priority simulations are um, complete. We're looking forward to doing further analysis on this. 
and we'll be doing extra ensemble members and some of our lower priority simulations over the course of uh, next year on the new supercomputer at MCI called Guardi, which is um, just about, or just has come online. And I want to say we're very grateful to the MCI for the ongoing support with the computation and very much particularly now with the data publication. So getting our stuff out onto the Earth System Grid through their Earth System Grid node, that makes it discoverable to the global community. It's really important for uptake of the results. So very grateful to MCI. Happy birthday, Gardi, born today, the 13th of November, 10 times more powerful than our previous computer region and part of the National Research Infrastructure for Australia through the Research Infrastructure Strategy. Um, yeah, I think all of us in the supercomputing community in this nation are really grateful for the support of NCI and the support to NCI. And that is the Earth System Grid Federation across all nodes, so Australia um, delivering directly in, into this project, which uh, fully, fully supports the same. Uh, it's how we get our data out, it's how we share it across the community. There's a lot of infrastructure involved, so Thank you, NCI. There's a huge amount of work behind. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but when you make sure you have a very controlled environment that's um, search friendly and usable and compatible across models, there's a whole lot of steps involved in there and it's a lot of work. So, um, yeah, I extend that gratitude. Couldn't give a hub seminar without talking about next users, two really important ones. Cortex, coordinated ocean uh, regional downscaling experiment. You can see a whole lot of high resolution downscaling experiments around the world going on by various groups there, including the Australian ones here, predominantly picking up on CNIP models to, to um, force those simulations, but at much higher, much higher resolution. <coughs> and they also share data from that internationally and publicly available through the Earth System Grid Federation. Uh, Australian projections, which feed on those efforts. So we had climate change in Australia in 2015, targeting Australia's natural resource management regions. Um, and going forward and uh, led by NESP researchers and uh, a lot of participation across the Australian community, uh, next gen projections coming forward, looking forward to. So that's going down to the finer scales from the SAMP6 data. The other big next user um, in the policy space is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which has put out a number of special reports recently, but of particular interest for CMIP is this one, the Assessment Report 6 due in April 2021, already well underway in, in its um, planning implementation. Uh, the first order draft went out earlier this year. It's gone through expert scientific review, we're all going to lose Christmas producing a second order draft by the 12th of January. These deadlines are immutable, so um, the late CMIP-6 is not really helping in this process. In fact, papers need to be submitted by the end of December to be accepted in the IPCC AR6 process. A lot of work going on internationally and I think the structures around CMIP-6 are really um, facilitating that, that results can make that transition from publication into uh, reports such as this and literature in a very timely fashion. Then papers need to be accepted out to September 2020, which is, by the way, is the deadline for data submission into the actual analyses and, and uh, iconic figures that will be in the assessment report, six working group one. So. Uh, once again, that will be greatly facilitated by, by senior processes. <coughs> I mentioned our high sensitivity. It's um, climate sensitivity in the model. It, it turns out a lot of the new kind of Rolls-Royce uh, best, biggest, best funded centres, most advanced centres in the world, in going from CMIP 5 to CMIP 6, a lot of models have found that they've got this, this higher, higher climate sensitivity, and that's going to be a big challenge for the community. I think going forward, um, <coughs> people are attributing it to, um, you know, um, more sophisticated cloud schemes, aerosol schemes, atmospheric physics, the high tops in the models up, up into the stratosphere. stratosphere and uh, it's, it's a, um, a big discussion point in the community at the moment of, of how we're going to deal with that and understand that going forward. So more updated 
uh, plot that um, I discovered from August 2019, showing that actually quite a few of the models, and this is coming from what's been published into semi 6 are also still falling back into that lower range that, that um, we saw in CMIP5. So that's about it from me, I think. Um, we've done our simulations. We're right on the edge of publishing this stuff. I think hopefully by next week at NCI, people, users there, will be able to pick up our post-process quality control CMIP6 data. And within a couple of weeks after that, we should be on the Earth system grid. So thank you. Sonia. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for a fantastic presentation. Uh, we might skip straight into questions. So just a reminder, if you do have a question, pop it into the chat box with the chat function in the Zoom platform there. Um, we've got a few questions and a few comments. So Simon, I thought I'd start with some comments. It's up to you whether you want to respond. Uh, the first one is from Claire Richards, who I'm assuming is with NCI, who says your comment about Gordy, is it Gordy or Gaudi? Gaudi. Gaudi was perfect timing. The official announcement has just come through. Thanks for your support, Simon. That's very nice, Claire. And um, I know that's been a huge effort going on at NCI over not just months, but you know, through a long planning phase. And um, we're very grateful for what they've done and a big congratulations, I think, from the whole community. Thank you. I should also qualify that the announcement, uh, actually when I read it in more detail, was saying that there's a little bit more of a delay before users get access. So I apologise for that. But we'll, call, we'll still call today the birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Thanks. Uh, we also have a comment from David Crowley who says, great to see the access Earth Systems Model 1.5 simulations being provided to CMIC 6. This is the first time that an Australian Earth Systems model has been submitted to the CMIC experiments. That's fantastic. And I'll make one comment there, David, that um, that was really possible because the Nest Hub work on CM2 provided all that extra support quite easily for the post-processing, et cetera, to, to uh, facilitate that. So I think they're a really um, important next user that have benefited from the work that we've done through the Hub project. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. All right, we have a question from Roger who asks, is CSIRO participating or going to participate in Cortex, Cortex 2? My understanding is, well, mm, I don't know. I believe so. There are plans to do next-gen downscaling experiments, which would be Cortex-style experiments, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yep, that was my understanding too. And we have another question from David who asks, Simon, the simulation for um, RCP 2.6 shows global warming in 2100, well above two degrees. Is this a sensible simulation to use for that ex emission scenario, given that it exceeds the two degrees warming target from the Paris Agreement? We develop the model, we take the prescribed forcings, we run the simulation, we show the result. So I think it's a sensible approach. Um, the model is quite sensitive, that said, but um, yeah. yeah. Okay, fabulous. Uh, Zhubing also has a question. He asks, how many realizations will be run for future scenarios? Um, with the ESM, there's already been a few of each scenario run. With the CM2, which is more expensive, we've got one of each at the moment. Um, the um, SSP4 RCP7 experiment is the defined um, ensemble multi-member experiment to groups that have limited resources if they're going to focus on one particular scenario it's the rcp7 is the recommended to do ensembles on but i think we would hope to do you know maybe three members of each with the cm2 model fabulous uh, we have another question um 
the Earth Systems model has three, oh, oh, this is Roger helping you answer, I believe. The Earth Systems model has three of each for concentration-driven SSPs so far. I think I said something like that, but I, I think that was about the same. <laughs> that for that. Thank you. Yep, and we also have another person responding about the Cortex. Um, CSIRO is a contributor to Cortex. The CSIRO CCAM model is on the Cortex RCM list. So there you go, too. So the regional climate model. Yep. And we have one more question that asks, is there a breakdown on the independence of the various models contributing to CMIC 6, i.e., Hang on a minute, sorry. I.e. some models share the same component, so how independent are they? Um, is there a breakdown? Yes, I don't have it at hand, but um, this has been dealt with in the literature. Are there interdependencies? Yes, there are. It's a, um, what can I say, incestuous community of interbred models with, with various components shared across, so there, and there are family trees, etc. Um, I believe in AR6 this will be at least addressed or, you know, laid out as it is. Okay, thanks. And you mentioned the big data issue that's coming up for the climate change science community. Will the new supercomputer be big enough to deal with that big data issue going forward? Um, to deal with it as best we can, yes. To deal with it sensibly, probably yes. To deal with it if you've just left it to the community. And last week there was an Australian Leadership Climate Symposium held, hosted by the NCI, um, NCI up in Canberra. And it was cross community. It was climate, astrophysics, genomics, geophysics, etc. There will always be a way to fill every supercomputer you can see possibly buildable in the next 10 years at any point in time. So um, it'll be probably better than what we had, but uh, there'll be always unfulfilled wishes. You know, even in Australia, we won't have locally all the same M6 data, the 20 to 30 petabytes. That's impossible. It's not resourceful like that. But we'll be, you know, a heck of a lot better off than we were in the previous generation going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, fabulous. All right, so I think we've worked our way through all the questions, which is fabulous. So that brings us to the end of the webinar. If there's any very last minute questions, please pop them in the uh, comments box. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you, Simon, for providing a really informative webinar, and also thank you to all the attendants for taking the time out to uh, listen to our webinar. So this is the last Hub webinar for 2019, but we will be continuing our webinar series next year with the first webinar starting in uh, mid-February of 2020. And that webinar will be provided by Dr. Vanessa Harvard from CSIRO. It'll be on the 18th of February. And Vanessa will explore the vulnerability of carbon stored in Australian eucalyptus forests and woodlands to warming. So more information on that webinar will be provided to you all early next year. And finally, if you have any questions about the webinar or about the Hub and the work that the Hub does in general, please get in contact. There's some in contact details on your screen at this moment. Um, and other than that, we hope to see you in the new year for the rest of our Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub Science webinars. So thank you, Simon, and thank you everyone for attending. Merry Christmas, everybody. Yes, true. Merry Christmas. Thank you. <laughs>